So, hi everyone. I'm Denny Daniel. I curate the Museum of Interesting Things. If you haven't heard of it, uh, what it does is it travels around the world, and now virtually even easier around the world. Um, and it shows people that their iPhones, their iPods didn't pop out of thin air, the device that you're holding in your hand. <laughs> uh, came from a long line of inventions. In fact, pretty much everything that I'm going to show you today, you could probably do with your one iPhone. Uh, so you'd have to have all this stuff in your pocket to do what your iPhone does. And I kind of call it the missing link factor. All the links in the chain until you get to the iPhone or the iPad or the iPod or whatever. Um, so, And when people invent things, it doesn't pop out of thin air. Inventors basically uh, solve a problem. Uh, that's what they do. And every day you solve a problem, which makes you an inventor. Um, and these shows have taught me to kind of be uh, a show must go on kind of person. Once I started learning that you don't have to have, you know, uh, Columbia University PhD to be an inventor. Basically, you just solve a problem just like a quicker way to butter your toast or a shortcut to, you know, uh, a class or something. So uh, today our show is the Suffragette Show uh, or Suffragist. Uh, I like to call it Suffragette City after the uh, David Poe song. Uh, and there's always this uh, debate on suffragette, suffragist. Uh, the British kind of empowered themselves with the word a little more than the Americans did. Um, I like the idea of empowering yourself with a word. Uh, I find a lot of movements do that, especially in the uh, in the you know the gay movement or whatever. You know, uh, they've empowered themselves with a lot of those words. Um, one of my favorite examples is the band Led Zeppelin. Uh, that was actually an insult from somebody. Uh, they had another name, and someone said, this band's terrible. They're going to sink like a Led Zeppelin. And they thought, you know what? That's better than the name we chose. So they named themselves Led Zeppelin, <laughs> ironically. So I always find that kind of to be kind of a funny story. Um, so the first item I always like to show in the museum is my Thomas Edison cylinder record player. These are the first record players uh, invented by Thomas Edison uh, around 1877 and this one is from the 1800s um, it is from around the late 1800s uh, early 1900s and this was his portable version you notice I was able to just move it around I bring it here in a handbag believe it or not um, and it's basically a record player that played cylinder records and I'll try it for you so uh, Imagine that you guys were winding this. When you guys come to a live show, I'll actually have you guys live uh, wind this. And what you're winding is there's a spring inside here, uh, a big metal spring that's almost like a sharpened car, like a car part. Not sharpened. And away we go. So these were the first record players. The woman you're hearing is Ada Jones. She was kind of the first big female recording artist back then. Now the only thing is I can tell that our, our uh, library uh, friend, Veronica, I can tell how angry she's getting uh, that, that it's much too loud. Clearly in a library you'd want to lower the volume. So can you guys figure out how to lower the volume on this thing? Well, all of you there, if you're wearing socks, <laughs> take off your socks and take off your shoes. Uh, because, Well, take off your shoes, take off your socks. Because you'd have to put a sock in the horn. Because it's a horn. How do you lower the volume? You put a sock in it. And we actually had professional librarians look it up. Uh, the term put a sock in it comes from the Thomas Edison horn. And these are the cylinders. And you'll notice that the name, they only had one place to put the name, and it's over here on the side. And they were made out of either wax, like beeswax, and a few other ingredients, or celluloid, like this one, which is just a fancy word for plastic. 
and the first records were two minutes long and, and um, the later records like this one were only four minutes long. So if your song was Hey Jude, you were done in the chorus. And as I said, that woman, uh, Ada Jones, uh, that's kind of a big thing to have, you know, a, a woman be that big a star uh, that early on. She's from like the early 1900s until around 1920s or so. Uh, she was a big star. And uh, she would have to sing into this horn, believe it or not. So these machines could actually record. Uh, you basically sing into the horn by the light of the silvery moon. And then it records like a sewing machine up and down. So just like when I talk to you, my mouth, my tongue makes sound waves that hit your eardrum. Instead of hitting your eardrum, you could hit tin or you could hit Play-Doh. Not Play-Doh, he was a big Greek guy. Or you could hit wax, beeswax. So I'd say, or Ada Jones would say something like, hello. And when you play it back, hello. It's just moving air the same way my mouth, my tongue uh, moves air. And she was a, a very big recording artist. I have probably around 30 to 40 of her records alone. Uh, she used to do a lot of duets with a guy called um, uh, Billy Murray also. Uh, but she was a big star in her own right and kind of what I like to call the first Lady Gaga <laughs> of the time, although she wasn't as wild as cra and crazy as Lady Gaga. But all the stars you know, like Billy Holiday, Bessie Smith, all those people, um, she's the one that started it all uh, and probably influenced all of those people. She was the first big female recording artist. And like I said, that was a big thing back then. So let me move this out of the way. And bring you an interesting book that people always wonder why I have this book in the museum collection for the suffragettes. Frankenstein. Why would I have Frankenstein? That has nothing to do. I mean, yes, we know that Mary Shelley wrote it, but it's not really a women's movement type book. But let's think about Mary Shelley. Who is Mary Shelley? She's actually the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, there's always been kind of a women's movement since as far back as the Greeks with the play Lysistrata. Uh, showing some sort of like female revolution. And if you haven't read Liz Estrada, um, I actually was in the play at NYU when I was there. Um, Liz Estrada is about the men going to war and the men get the women getting angry and saying, we're going to create some sort of like little revolution. And they decide uh, not to be intimate with the men in order for that, so that they stop having all these perpetual wars. I don't know. Right now, we seem to have a lot of perpetual wars sometimes. Maybe that would help. Um, so, you know, fast forward to the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, um, there begins a new movement that begins with Mary Wilson Craft. Uh, why? Because now, if you know the philosopher Rousseau, you remember him, he wrote a book called Emily. And in this book, he portrays women in a way that didn't appeal to Mary at all. So she ended up writing a response to it, this book, The Vindication of the Rights of Women. This begins the modern women's movement, women's rights movement. Um, and just to have someone writing a book who's a woman at, at, at that era, you know, the late 1700s, early 1800s, is cutting edge enough. But to write a, a book on the rights of women was even more cutting edge. Um, and then her daughter writes Frankenstein all those years later. So that's why I end up having Frankenstein in the collection, uh, because that was her daughter. Now, the movement in the 1800s wasn't just women's suffrage and women getting the vote. And I always like to emphasize that. Uh, it was actually kind of three movements. So, so often I bring one of these. That is a prescription to get medicinal whiskey. Why would I bring that? <laughs> well, because the temperance movement 
was also part of that movement. Prohibition uh, was also part of the movement. Um, and also the civil rights movement. Often I bring civil rights items to this. That It was kind of one movement. And somewhere in the mid-1800s, uh, people realized that we're not going to get men to agree to all three. Freeing the slaves, prohibition, getting rid of alcohol, and women getting the right to vote. So it kind of separated and People went into one movement, the other movement, or the other the other movement. They, you know, made their bed and lied in it, and would lie in it. Um, I mean, there was always some sort of overlap, but it became three kind of separate movements. I always find it interesting that they freed the slaves before any of those two movements. And prohibition, by the way, uh, prohibition didn't exactly um, didn't exactly begin. At, 1918 or so, 1920. Uh, a lot of states and a lot of cities went dry before that. Um, and then finally, the entire country uh, went dry. Um, but it kind of was what I like to call a rolling uh, prohibition. So that was the three movements that were kind of the main movements. And then when you get to the women's rights movement, that wasn't just one issue either. Uh, so it wasn't just about getting the vote. It was about many other things. So I like to bring in, when I talk about this, these cute postcards they used to make. <laughs> Women wearing these pants. And what were these pants? They were uh, bloomers. Uh, but then they were harem, harem, harem pants. Um, so why are they called Bloomer? Amelia Bloomer. Uh, she was a writer. She had her paper, uh, which, like I said, is pretty cutting edge in and of itself. And, uh, she went to a foreign country like Turkey and saw women wearing these harem pants. And she, and women in America were wearing bustle dresses. And she, you know, it was practically bondage. And I'll show you a bustle dress. So this is, and all of you are going to go crazy over this. Everyone is going to want to wear one of these. This is because of how beautiful it is, but maybe not because of the bondage. Um, this is an original 1880s uh, silk bustle dress. And you would have had a big bustle here. And you could hardly walk with these things. You wouldn't be able to sit on a bicycle. You wouldn't be able to sit on the subway. Um, even dancing was difficult. If you were doing a waltz, most of the steps would be forward uh, because walking backwards, you could practically get killed. It wasn't that easy. Um, so part of the movement had to do with the fashion of the times. And I'll show you some of the literature on what ladies sh should be wearing. I bookmarked a couple of pages for you with some really good pictures. I think I showed that one. So it was also a movement on fashion to wear clothing that allowed them to be a little, to to be freer. Um, now I have one of the suffragette items. One of a suffragette dress. I'll show you the jacket because it gives you an idea of the mood. Now, normally, you guys are thinking, wait a second, I thought I remember the suffragettes wearing those white dresses. They did. But this was the British movement. The British felt that it, you know, there's two ways to make change. Uh, so the British felt that it was a little more, I'd like to say, punk rock. <laughs> um, they felt that to affect any kind of change, you would have to shake things up a little bit. So their movement was a little more militant, and their clothing was a little more militant. Now, this is an original suffragette dress from that era. I'll show you the back. And like I said, when we go live, 
I'll let one of you guys try this on. So um, hopefully we'll do it at the library or you can come over here. But the dresses were, the clothing was a little more militant and because they felt that, it, you know, they needed to shake things up a little more. The American movement was more of the girly white because they felt you can get more bees with honey. So they dressed, you notice, with the big hats and, and uh, you know, the, the feathers and all this other stuff and the, the white dresses. So one of the reasons behind the white dress was kind of, like I said, the more, you know, a little more feminine, uh, like I said, to get, you know, get more bees with honey that way. And yeah, I always like to say, you know, different ways to skin a cat. Sorry, cat. And speaking of cat, I brought my cat from 1910. So that is an original suffragette postcard from around 1910 with the cat. And uh, it says, we demand the vote. And earlier on, I was looking at Veronica, and I noticed that she was wearing some of these colors. That's because our librarian here is actually a suffragette spy. Yes, sorry to out you, Veronica, <laughs> right here. Oh, no, it's fine. I actually made a video about Mary Shelley's mother uh, two weeks ago. It's on our YouTube channel. Oh, really? That's, that's funny. That's what a coincidence. Then we should, uh, we should definitely post a link uh, so that people can look at it. Um, that book, uh, you know, I always mention that, that book, Frankenstein, isn't really written about about monsters. It's written about mass hysteria. Hmm, what are we going through right now? Uh, it's written about the fact that when there is mass hysteria, often there is a problem, but people tend to uh, tend to go a little bit crazy. And they, I think they call it COVID crazy now. Um, and that often causes bad decisions. Um, and that's why Frankenstein was kind of written to see, to show what happens, you know, kill the monster. You know, he's harming the woman. Um, so the, the idea is, you know, that mob mentality is not the way to make decisions. The proper way to make decisions is the government that we worked so hard. Um, and, and I think it's really uh, brilliant of her to do it in that kind of uh, vehicle. Um, but getting back to the, to the colors. So you'll notice, and if you guys look at the clothing that you're wearing now, let me know if you're wearing any green, white, or violet. And if any of you uh, ladies, and even if the men, they could be uh, co-conspirators, uh, are wearing green, white, or violet, you're wearing the suffragette colors. And why those colors? Because it was an acronym. It stood for something. Green, white, violet stood for give women the vote. So the next time you see someone wearing one of those colors, you can have a little bit of fun and say to them, you're obviously a suffragette. Spy. And this is actually one of the department stores that sold, I'm looking for my glasses, that sold the uniforms, as they would call it, the Selfridge Company on Oxford Street. And for those of you who know England, you'll know this is a very, it's kind of like a Harrods type store. Ah, Donna, excellent. <laughs> Clearly, Donna is one of our suffragette spies. <laughs> so for those of you who know, it's kind of like uh, a Harrods tie. That store is still around and very, very chic. And that was kind of these stores catered to the suffragettes in England. Uh, they clothed them. And I, I love going through some of these postcards. Now, we were talking about, um, we were talking about the clothing and it being kind of bondage. And once you have the suffragette fashion line, now women are able to do more things, like ride bicycles. Now, at first, men resisted and said, no, 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 women should not be riding bicycles, clear. Um, and here is why. There you go. <laughs> That's what happened. So they had all these kind of funny cards that were supposed to, like, demonize and mock the uh the, the suffragist uh movement um so that's what would happen if women would ride a bicycle 
Now, what I find funny is that as soon as they realized that they could sell bicycles, let me get my advertisement, as soon as they realized that they could make money, <laughs> then it became a different animal. Then it was okay to sell bicycles to women. And that is an original ad from back then. Yeah, once it comes to products, it becomes not a problem. And, you know, this, go this comes back to today. I was watching one of the news stations. I forget which one. Um, and they, ha they were interviewing um, some of the people in Saudi Arabia. And at first, they resisted giving women uh, the right to drive a car. And then all of a sudden, when they realized, wait a second, a lot of these women are married to Arab sheiks who have lots of money, and now they're going to have to buy cars for their wives. They actually have separate dealerships just to sell cars to women. Now it's become a big business uh, selling the cars to women. So it's just like the days of, you know, doing the bicycle. And they made all sorts of fun games. Now this is a reproduction. It's hard to find the original on this one. The Great Victorian Cycle Race Board Game. And I, I love the graphics on this. And it's pretty much the same graphics they had back in the 1800s. Or early 1900s. And here's my other factors. Now, another major point was giving women the right to vote. Men would say, well, if you give them the right to vote, who's going to cook? Who's going to clean? And women, Donna, Veronica, think about it. Even today, isn't the woman the head of the household? So imagine back in the 1800s, women were clearly even more the head of the household. So if women are the head of the household, we must agree that clearly giving them the right to vote then the whole house should fall apart. I mean, who's going to feed the child? Who's going to feed the cat? Who's going to do the laundry? I mean, look, look at the situation. I mean, here's clear evidence of what would happen, what kind of disarray. We've got the crying baby over there. We've, we've got the cat. Look, he's got to do this laundry. God knows how the dinner must be burning. I mean, clearly, you must all agree that if women are the head of the household, then if they give them the right to vote, then clearly in that five minutes it takes to vote, the whole house should clearly fall apart and the entire country would just fall apart and nothing would get done. And, you know, I, they made thousands of these postcards, you know, mocking this and demonizing it, that women should not be in charge, you know, not vote because of that. And I always thought to myself, wait a second, how come no one ever made the extra leap after that logic? If we accept that the house would fall apart it, because women are the head of the household, then aren't men in charge, of, in charge of all the corporations and in charge of all the governments in the entire world? So clearly, if the logic is that if women are the head of the household, the household should fall apart, then if men are the head of the government and all the corporations, then if men have the right to vote, then shouldn't all the corporations and the governments fall apart? In fact, perhaps that's why we have such a political situation going on currently with every side. Yeah, I always found it funny that they came out with all these postcards and nobody came out with a counter postcard saying, yeah, well, wouldn't the whole world fall apart if men got the right to vote? And once again, watching the news, uh, another, another person in, uh, funny enough, Saudi Arabia again, uh, and I think it was like either CNN or, or New York One News I was watching, and they interviewed a guy who was saying they were trying to give women the vote currently. It was only in the past, like, I don't know, 10 years or so, 20 years that I saw this. And, I, and this guy was saying, how can I give my wife the right to vote? Who's going to feed my kids? Who's going to clean the house? Who's going to take care of things? And you'd think this guy was really old. No, the guy they interviewed was probably in his late 20s, early 30s, which shows how this logic 
still exists. We, you know, finally have the, the you know, finally realize, well, 100 years ago, realize that this was absurd. But believe it or not, this still exists even, you know, today. Um, and a lot of the countries didn't get the vote as soon as America. Uh, Japan, I believe, was in the 70s. France was after America as well. A lot of countries took a lot longer uh, than America. It's, it's really fascinating how long it took. Um, and using that same kind of absolutely ridiculous uh, logic. And I'll show you some of the more pleasant postcards. That's actually by a famous artist, Clapstick. And since everybody loves cats, with the same fun colors. Another one of the articles of clothing is the hats that you always see, those absolutely beautiful hats. And often they would have hat pins in these hats, very long hat pins. Men were so afraid of this that they actually outlawed hat pins that were longer than nine inches. Yeah, you could not have a hat pin longer than I think it was either seven or nine men inches. And I actually brought here, where did I put it? There it is, some hat pins. So these are period hat pins. These are regulation hat pins. This is the correct size. I'm a guy. This is a regulation hat pin. Like I said, longer ones, men were afraid that women would use these as weapons and get aggressive and stab them. But this was safe. Now, I want you to see something. I'm going to show you my profile, and then I'm going to take this hat pin. Does it go all the way through my neck out the other side? I always found it interesting that this was considered okay, and yet this, I, I wouldn't want to be poked with, one, with this being one inch long. Needless to say, being seven inches long, that would be insane. <laughs> You're here for the internet, right? I'm, I, uh, I'm using the telephone because I had no choice. That didn't work for a while. Uh, you can check on this device. You, I'm, you're welcome to touch the stuff because I'm doing a presentation. There's 30 or 40 people. Um, all you have to do is get to this part of it. And there. So there you go. Um, so, see how quickly we get tech support around here? We're pretty fast. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Cool. So, I always find it very funny with the hat pins and that story. So, around... 1920, 1920 is when they finally get to vote in their very, very first election. And I brought some of the Holy Grail items in the museum here. These are actual poll books from the 1920 election. And in here, you see that they're alphabetized. You actually have the women who voted in that election. And I went through it. Funny enough, there's more women than men that voted in this election, <laughs> or at least at this polling station. And people always like to see some of the names. Handwriting was interesting, huh? And like I said, when the world opens up, We'll hopefully do the show again for you guys. And you'll be able to actually come over and touch some of these items. But I want you to at least get a feel from it here. And you wouldn't be able to read all of these anyway if, we, if the world opened up. So you're going to get a much better view this way. <laughs> okay. Ironically. Um, now you'll notice on the book it says men voters. Because this happened so quickly they didn't even get a chance to change the book. 
So that, so women were voting, but they still didn't put women or any voters on this. It still says men voters. In that same county in 1922, they finally corrected that. <laughs> and it doesn't say men voters anymore on it. <laughs> and uh, Veronica, I'm not sure if we did this show with you before, but I got a new item that you're going to go crazy over. I got this original poll book, and you know when you go to the election sites, they have the big poster that says everything on it. So here it is. From the original suffrage election. And this is the actual voting machine. Now, this is a training voting machine from 1920. And what I find amazing, let me see if I can get it close enough for you guys. Let me get my glasses so I can see where it says it, because you'll be amazed at who is running against the person at the time. There it is, it's down over here. So we all know that. President Harding, he won that election. But if you look down here, who is running against him as vice president? Franklin Delano Roosevelt was running against Harding and lost that election. And we all know what happened later. <laughs> he ended up winning as president. But he was running as vice president during that election with uh, uh, Cox, K uh, C O X, uh, with the other side. Now that machine you notice is a little bit small because that was actually a testing machine. Uh, that was a teaching machine for people to learn how to vote. And of course in 1920, who was learning how to vote? Women. Men already knew how to vote. So what I found, what I find really beautiful about that machine was that was probably used by the suffragettes in that election. So that's, I am beyond proud of that. Uh, maybe we'll even let you guys borrow it one time at the library for a couple of months. Um, but yeah, that is one of my favorite of the items. And then there were the posters they made that were, uh, um, you know, pro the movement. Now, this is an important guy. Let me make sure I read his name correctly from what I call Flag. James Montgomery Flagg with two G's. Now, the story behind James Montgomery Flagg that I find interesting that they got him to do uh, this, women bring all voters into the world, let women vote, <clears throat> is he is the guy that did Uncle Sam. He is the artist that did Uncle Sam, believe it or not. Um, Uncle Sam was based on... Uncle Sam was based on... Uh, originally an army soldier, he says that it was an army soldier he saw on a train ride, um, but it was based on an army soldier originally, um, and the figure that you see, it was originally in a magazine called Leslie Magazine, published the first, you know, image of Uncle Sam. It actually goes back a little further, though, it goes back to, like, the 1800s, uh, but they finally put a face to Uncle Sam. And then later, if you look at the later versions of Uncle Sam, it actually looks like Montgomery Flagg. It started to look more and more like him over, over time, and eventually pretty much it's Montgomery Flagg. Uh, but originally it was an army soldier. Now, once women get the vote, um, we of course have the war, and women end up as part of the, uh, as part of the war effort. Oh, I should show you this. These are some of the demonstrations that happened back then. And you see how large they were. And I've got one of a New York one. We had some technical difficulties earlier, so that's why I have to like run around the place to do things. <laughs> uh, 
And these are original newspapers from then. Um, but then after the war, you know, during the war, of course, women are running the country. You know, they're in the plants and all that other stuff. Uh, and they came out with all sorts of interesting books in the early to mid 1900s about women getting jobs, how to get the job. Thanks, me. Does it work? Uh, it's going to work. If you have connection, it should be okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's on. It's, it's supporting you, but if, you, if you have the connection and the streaming too, I, I wouldn't change. No, I'm not changing anything. I just want to know because I have other things late, uh, later, other if days. If you're connected, it's safe to say you will be connected. Okay, good. <laughs> when, when this is done, I'll check. Um, but I'm definitely not going to. If it works, if it ain't broke, I am. It's, I have some stuff for you. You do? Yes. Excellent. Right, we'll talk about I it. love you more than life. <laughs> so you heard it here. We're getting another donation. Um, so. You know, once uh, you, you have women, you know, working in the war effort, once the wars are over, the two wars, now trying to get them back into the kitchen and trying to figure out what is the next um, phase was a whole different animal. And it was a very important book. I'm not sure if all of you know about it. I'm not sure if it's in the library. We'll have to, you know, Veronica may have to order this one. The Second Self. Is kind of the second wave of the movement. When people are trying to find a new identity between, you know, work and um, between work and being a mother at home, uh, you see all those 1950s, you know, behavior type films. Uh, we have a lot of those films, uh, you know, the manners films and all that other stuff. Um, it's kind of like another identity crisis on what to do now. Uh, it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle once you've been working in factories, once you've been, you know, putting bread on the table. It becomes a whole different animal. So it's, um, you know, it's a whole different movement at that point. Uh, the next big change uh, comes a little bit later. Once you have the... Uh, the 1960s and we have uh, contraception and all that other kind of stuff, you have a whole new world going on. And this book, uh, hopefully the library has it. And if not, I guess Veronica now has something to get. <laughs> the feminine mystique. Now you have a whole new movement, the sexual revolution and a different kind of empowerment. Um, and that becomes kind of the next wave of uh, the movement. And we're actually living through the last wave of what I think the movement is with the Me Too movement and all that. Um, I think this is a, an, another current movement. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be a book that really solidifies all of it, but that whole concept solidifies all of it. But that's kind of the, you know, the progression. It, it seems to happen in those you know, in those kind of changes. Uh, early 1700s with Wilson Craft really beginning everything, then mid 1800s when it kind of separates. Uh, these are broad strokes, of course. Um, and then you have the actual getting the vote in the early 1900s. Then you have the wars changing everything and, and creating a whole new kind of identity. Then after the wars, trying to figure out what is your identity now that the men are back, um, and you have second self, and then you go through the 60s and the revolution, and then you go through, of course, today's period. And having women in the workplace. And these are, these are actually wire photos. These photos that I'm showing you aren't actually photos at all. They're called wire photos. And what are wire photos? They're actually faxes. Um, they're fax, fax, like right out of a fax machine. Um, and they go back to around the 1930s. People think uh, faxes were only developed uh, recently. A lot of people think, oh, yeah, in the 1980s, you had those 
fax machines that were terrible. Everything looked like stick figures. Um, believe it or not, newspapers had fax machines this good that were photographic quality. This is not a photograph. It's got a line screen. This is actually a fax. And you see the copy on the bottom. Newspapers would use this to get pictures across. And then they would use uh, teletype machines to get the copy, the text across, because teletype machines were cheaper. And doing a picture over the wires was more expensive. So we take it for granted, you know, that we get pictures so quickly in our newspapers. But, and we think that's a modern thing, being able to fax pictures and send pictures. Now you just email pictures. Um, but the truth is, think about it. The newspapers that came out uh, in the 1940s, they would have pictures. How did you, how did you have breaking news in New York and a picture the next day in LA? Carrier pigeon, the post office, flying a plane? They couldn't do that that quickly. There's no way to get a picture to L.A. overnight that fast. And to do that every night of the week, because there were pictures in the newspapers every day. They had fax machines that were huge. They were this big. And they were able to do photography all those years. Any newspaper reporter will tell you, oh, yeah, these were wire photos. And that's how you got pictures across. So when JFK got shot, the picture was everywhere. All over the country, even small papers had it. That's not because they used the post office and someone sent, made a thousand copies of the picture and put it on the front page. That's because they had these machines, um, these fax machines that were much better than the fax machines we had now. And then the type, like I said, was on the back. But this was sent by a different machine. And I told you it was a teletype machine. I actually own one of these in the museum. I had to go all the way to Pittsburgh to pick it up. A huge machine. And you had women doing this all day long on these giant machines. And that would send the text across how to operate a teletypewriter. I actually keep this on my teletype machine, which is in my living room, <laughs> where I do actually private shows also. So that was kind of one of the occupations that you'd always see women doing. Um, now, there was another occupation that we always associate with women, the operator. You know, if you ever, if you know Lily Tomlin, one ringy dingy. Uh, and of course, I always like to bring my rotary phone to illuminate this. <laughs> do you remember having to do that and win concert tickets? I won tickets to you too using a rotary phone. Now, in the early Days when the phone first comes out, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, you've got operators using these telephones, and there were switchers, and it was often kids, you know, doing this, and it was often men uh, picking up the phone. And it turns out that uh, little boys were kind of rude. Uh, imagine that. Uh, people started figuring out that that didn't work so well. And that's why you end up having the woman operator, uh, because they weren't quite as rude as the, uh, as the men operators were. Uh, let's see what items I didn't get to do. I think we got almost all of the items, believe it or not. We managed to get through this pretty nicely. I'm impressed. <laughs> let me see what time it is. How are we doing with time? Not too bad. Not too bad. So I can add a few other items that I don't always get to talk about. So this one here is the solar space phone from around 1962. Um, and it really was a solar space phone. Uh, the sun's rays would come down here. It would go into there. He would talk into that. And then she would listen. And if you think the box is cool, there's the actual solar space phone. What I find interesting is that the guy can only talk and she can only listen. It doesn't work the other way around. <laughs> it, it's only a one-way telephone, unfortunately. So pretty much that's all my items on the shelves. Thank you very much, Veronica, and everyone in the room. I hope you enjoyed all the items that I brought.